Welcome, everybody, to Hoops HD. It is uh, the start of the 2021-2022 season. Uh, this is our very first preseason podcast, our ACC preview. And uh, David, this is my one of my favorite moments of the season because we have more podcasts and more college basketball to go from now until the national champion is crowned than any time we'll ever have the rest of the season. Am I right? Uh, very true. We are recording this. I don't know when we're going to post it. Well, we'll probably post it tonight, but on October 18th, uh, we are actually less than 48 hours away from the first Division One exhibition game. The NAI has already played a couple games. So as of Wednesday, October 20th, we have at least one college basketball game a day until the day after Selection Sunday. It is the longest expanse of college basketball in front of us. Now, again, nothing counts until the second Tuesday in November, but we do have games. Yeah, it's, uh, that game Wednesday night involves uh, Miami Hurricanes, an ACC it does, school an that, ACC we will, team. that we will get to at some point this evening. And, uh, and we're going to be making <laughs> picks, and uh, I, I'll give you a sneak preview of my uh, look, pick. I like the Canes in that one. Let, 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 me, let me, we're not previewing, we're not picking exhibition games, David. Uh, let me introduce who's here, though. I'm Chad Sherwood. You've heard from it already. On my right is David Briggs. To my left is John Titel, or maybe I got them backwards. Uh, bottom row, we've got Rocco Miller joining us from Bracketeer.org, Joby Fortson. Uh, we had one or two other people that are supposed to join us maybe tonight. Maybe they'll hop in as we go along. Maybe not. Who knows? Uh, that's kind of the way we do things here. But our goal for tonight is this is the ACC preview show for the 2021-22 season. Uh, we're going to go through all 15 or 16 or 30 teams, or how many teams this league has these days. Uh, and then at the end of the show, we'll go through each of you and have, tell me how many teams are going to make the field and who those teams are, and we'll go from there. Uh, but this is the ACC. And Rocco, let me start with you because it is going to be the story, maybe unfortunately, all season long is going to be the Coach K retirement tour at Duke. Uh, uh, how good, coming off of a season when they did not make the NCAA tournament, uh, not only did they, they, well, they said they weren't going to go anyway because of COVID, and then maybe they were going to go, but either way, they wouldn't have qualified. The selection committee said, no, you weren't good enough. But uh, what are your thoughts on this Duke team in the coming up this season in the Coach K retirement tour? Yeah. So first of all, Coach K retirement tour. It's it's. I'm not the biggest fan. I think it's a little like super, a little narcissistic in my opinion. I got. I don't think he had to call so much attention on himself. Obviously, an unbelievable coaching career. He's a legend, Hall of Famer. Uh, you know, he's been around longer than my lifetime. So it's a uh, it's a lot to celebrate. And and from the opposite standpoint, it's cool. Uh, but you know, this should be more about the team he has now. And, and there's a lot, um, a lot of changes since last year, obviously everybody's talking about Paolo Panchero. Uh, unfortunately he's not playing for the Washington Huskies. He's playing for the Duke Blue Devils straight out of Seattle. His mother is a, uh, UW basketball legend. Um, but, uh, just not enough power there to get him to stay home. He ends up at Duke. He's being considered a player of the year by several, uh, certainly an ACC player of the year candidate, uh, you bring in another guy, AJ Griffin, a big time recruit. When the war's back, you know, the question marks are uh, can Jeremy Roach handle the, the point guard duties full time? He had a solid year last year, but I mean, this Duke team last year just um, fell apart late. You know, uh, Johnson quit the team at, in the middle of February. You had a lot of just different moving parts. They were never. <laughs> they were never really in it in the, in the bubble picture uh, for real. Like it was a very strange year and uh, you know, they had to play on the opening day of the ACC tournament. And so I think, you know, there's enough guys coming back from that uh, with this new, new mix of players. How are they going to match up against older teams? I still think there's a lot of question marks. The hype is real. There's NBA players. Absolutely. But uh, I, I can see a large range of outcomes from this team. Uh, one of the questions I have is, is this a retirement tour or something like what we've seen some of these rock bands do? It, it's a gimmick to sell tickets. Uh, Duke yeah, maybe yeah. struggling to fill Cameron Indoor Stadium. Uh, really struggled <laughs> last year. And, um, uh, you, you know, are, are we going to see after this immediately next uh, the Coach K reunion tour where he gets back and uh, coaches another season with Duke? Uh, um I have a brief hiccup there. Sorry, guys. But uh, um, 
be, beyond the Coach K retirement tour, uh, Titel, what we did, we are not going to get, thankfully, is a second retirement tour. We, at least we didn't have one last year with uh, Roy Williams. Uh, but we do have a coaching change in North Carolina with Hubert Davis coming in here. Uh, another team with a very disappointing season last year as well. Yeah, only two changes in the ACC coaching-wise. Uh, Hubert Davis is in for Roy Williams. And, of course, up in Chestnut Hill, Earl Grant takes over for Jim Christian. Um, it's going to be interesting to see because they have a very – new kind of lineup. So they went 18 and 11 the last year, got destroyed by Wisconsin in the first round of the tournament. And they lost a ton of big men, Dayron Sharp, Garrison Brooks, Walker Kessler. Luckily, they bring back Armando Baycott, who was a 2019 McDonald's All-American. They bring in Brady Manick from Oklahoma. They bring in Dawson Garcia, who was a 2020 McDonald's All-American at Marquette. So the cupboard is not fully bare. Um, and I think they'll be okay in the front court. Back court, they still bring in. They still bring back Caleb Love. He was good last year. Um, Hubert has a great coaching staff of a bunch of former Carolina guys like Sean May and Jeff Lebo and stuff. Um, schedule looks decent. Uh, Purdue will be tough. Villanova or Tennessee will be tough. Michigan very tough. UCLA very tough. So they're going to get tested early and often. Hopefully that'll get them ready for ACC play in the months ahead. Well, well, Joby, I'm not that crazy on the Hyde Carolina team. And kind of like what, what Titel said, they lost so much in the front court, but they rebuilt that. I, I'm, my question is beyond Caleb Love, what, what they have in the backcourt. Yeah, and, the, and though the key is, I think, can Dawson Garcia make threes? That's because what Hubert wants to do is different than Roy. He's not going to run the same offense as Roy. Roy was that traditional pounded inside you guys hey you've watched Carolina for years you know exactly how they played Kessler was who transferred away was a perfect example of the type of person that does it Armando Baycott is a le leftover but now he wants to use stretch fours and now but that puts more pressure on making the shots you can't just have Caleb Love being the guy trying to do a you know a, a uh, impersonation you know of guards pass like page etc you need those guys to actually have other threats i think a lot relies on garcia but and i have to take the i have to take the shot so you're you're McCoy and you are about to maybe start at Virginia. So you transfer to North Carolina because they have an opening. And now you're fourth on the depth chart and not probably going to see much playing time definitively less than you would have you'd stayed. You know, just saying transfer portal doesn't always work out. I, I think we're going to be complaining a lot about the transfer portal this year or talking about a lot, talking about, you know, people who maybe shouldn't have transferred a, a lot and, yeah. Maybe hopefully the portal will be less as crazy in future years. But uh, David, we we got it. We I really want to talk about another team here though. That um, here, here's a stat for you. There's three teams in the, in the nation that have made each of the last three Sweet Sixteens: uh, Michigan, Gonzaga, and uh, Florida State. Yeah, um, Florida State uh, was on the brink in the year they didn't make the Sweet Sixteen, the COVID year. Uh, remember, they were on the brink of a one seed. They were mm -hmm. the first place team in the ACC. I think that they were potentially final four good. Uh, lots of turnover there, and they did lose some key players, but they've sort of reloaded, and the MO for Florida State is hard as this is to believe, as good as they've been. They still almost sort of always appear to be under the radar at the start of the season. Uh, I believe they are into the preseason top 25 that came out today, yeah. but... Um, I, I don't know. There's a lot of question marks with this team. Uh, they There was quite a bit of turnover, but I do think that they really have some good players that are strong newcomers, and if they can mesh, they might be going back to yet another Sweet 16 and getting yet another protected seed. Yeah, uh, Rocco, your, your thoughts on, the, on this Florida State team? Uh, Anthony Polite, uh he's back. He's bringing Caleb Mills, and you got, I think, four guys over 6'11 on this team. Uh, I, think, I think they have everything, honestly. Yeah, Chad, I, I, I like the roster makeup. I think it's very prototypical of what we've seen from Leonard Hamilton in the last handful of years with the, the super long wingspans, uh, bouncy wings, guys who can shoot, super athletic guards. Caleb Mills should be the, the primary, I think, but don't know a lot about the freshman Warley and, and Cleveland. They have huge potential. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a team with the, the ceiling to win the ACC for sure. And I think the floor is a lot higher now with Florida State than it ever has been because 
just the consistent winning year in and year out. And there's enough coming back, you know, with that five COVID seniors in the rotation, which means tons of experience to mix in some young guys. Um, this could work out really well, but at the same time, there's enough unproven where you kind of hedge them somewhere in the top 20 probably. But uh, yeah, I think the ceiling is pretty high. Yeah, uh, Worley's okay. the key uh, because Barnes was such a key component and, and had size that Worley, Worley's still 6'4", but I mean, Barnes was a unique, uh, was a unique guy. Uh, oh, yeah. as a PowerPoint. Um, if Worley can perform like I think he can, all of what we've said about Florida State and re repeat to the Sweet 16 is in the cards. Yeah. Uh, another team that, that had a that I think is definitely worth discussing, Ty Tell, is, is, is what Mike Young is doing in Virginia Tech. Uh, is, yeah. is this team now necessarily moving up into the among the elites of the ACC or close um, to it? Uh, Absolutely not. Okay, um, you're mean, not a Vontech you guy. Think that if you're telling me that Duke and Carolina are going to like be bottom feeders for a decade, sure, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I do like the fact that they're bringing in all these transfers and Coach Mike Young, talk about like he's got a grip on like Wofford. He brings in Storm Murphy, he brings in Kevin Aluma, and they all produce. Like I think he's got a lot of great pieces in place. Um, very talent-laden and experienced group, even though the transfers are new. You got Naheem Elaney back. He had 28 points last year to, when they lost to Florida in overtime in the tournament. He's got uh, Justin Mutz in the front court, um, who's pursuing his second master's degree. Um, Mike Young can coach. He's the defending conference coach of the year. Um, the schedule is decent and winnable, but I don't, I'm not ready to put them in like the top four, like the Virginia, Florida states of the league. David, do you want to differ with him? No, I actually kind of agree. Okay. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't put him, like I said, I don't think that they're contending for final fours like yeah. the team, top teams in the ACC do. So when I say they're not among the elite in the ACC, you have to understand what we're saying. What we're saying is that they're not final four good. <laughs> okay. uh, you, well, you know, uh, are they a step below that? Very, what's that? Uh, do you think they're, do you think they're a sweet 16 type? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I think they could be a protected seed. I've loved Mike Young ever since he was at Walford. I, I definitely think he's got them going in the right direction. It's really fun having Virginia Tech good in basketball. Uh, who doesn't like listening to inner Sandman 10 times a day? Um, so, yeah, I yeah, I think they could. I think they I think they're a top 25 team. I think they could contend for a spot in the sweet 16, maybe even get a protected seed. They're good. Uh, Joby, we're talking Virginia Tech. I, we've got to talk talk their chief rival, of course, and your school. How, how about how about the other school from the state of Virginia in the ACC here? Um, more unknowns this year, uh, and we say we kind of said it the last couple of years unknowns, and it turned out at least in terms of the regular season turned out quite well uh, in terms of regular season titles, etc. I don't see a regular season title in the cards this year. Uh, the we're going to have to see if the defense returns to what it once was. And I'm not so sure hundred percent that that will be the case. You know, now that you don't have Huff and Hauser out on the perimeter, not exactly defensively a fit for the pack line and replaced with folks uh, like Amon Franklin from the Indiana transfer and others who probably will fit more the pack line. We'll see, but you got, you know, and, you know it's, until you know it, uh, you don't know it until you see it. The problem Virginia has this year is the outside shooting that was provided. Gardner's going to get his points on the inside. Uh, the transfer from East Carolina, who's a two time uh, American Athletic Conference uh, all, uh, first teamer. Yeah. Um, Not but, something East Carolina has many of. No, no. Often. He was, he was. <laughs> For those who follow the transfer portal, he was just about one of the top most recruited guys in the portal in Virginia, was the one who was able to bring him home. But with Hauser and Huff leaving, I point that out, those are stretch fours when I was talking about North Carolina and Garcia, Dawson Garcia. Virginia doesn't necessarily have that, so they need a traditional three that can hit. Um, maybe they have a stretch four in the pro from, uh, from overseas, uh, Milicic. Maybe Tane Murphy, who's also Tane Murray, who was also a pro before coming, could provide some outside shooting. If they don't, or Carson McCorkle, who was very highly rated as a shooter coming out. Notice I said if, if, if there. That's a lot of ifs. And yeah, Virginia could hit on that and be right back to where they've been as an NCAA tournament team on the wearing white. 
but it could also go the other way. And 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 very early in the season, they got tested at Houston. Think they're going to win that one? They could, <laughs> because we're, we'll see. I mean, you know, I, I it's not like everything's so miss. Hey, Mills is now playing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is not playing in the ACC. So, we're, you know, you, you got to look at uh, both sides of it, but they could because they, you know, they do have, and I didn't mention the obvious components of Virginia. They do have Kia Clark. I mean, he's and yes, he could even take another year after this one, you know, talk about a guy who's been there forever. And then maybe the biggest factor uh, that I'm almost saying will happen is Reese Speakman will become a star and a future NBA level player. Um, Beekman's the real deal. He's going to be looking to take more of his shot this year um, and drive in the lane. And I think the shot against Syracuse, for those who follow the team, where they won in the final seconds in the ACC tournament, that has clearly given him, by all reports, has given him that confidence to become that go-to leader in a lot of ways. So, the, you know, there are pieces that can start early but can they put it all together and find that other shooter to pair with Beekman and when Clark has the space to shoot? Uh, another thing, Joby, are you at all concerned about the decline we've seen in Virginia uh, since they won the national championship? They have not repeated. Is, is, is Coach Bennett on the hot seat uh, failing to make the top 15 of the Ken Palm last year? Yeah, and, and you look at the Ken Palm, you look at the Ken Palm this year, you know, Virginia actually has is not great in the preseason Ken Palm for the first time that I can ever remember. I mean, oh. so it is a very interesting component. Yeah, Ben is on the hot seat. We all know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I missed all those. I, I missed that running gag about how uh, he was on the hot seat. Uh, Rocco, uh, one of the more interesting teams, I think, this year in the ACC is, is Louisville, uh, who starts off the season without a head coach. And uh, I, I, I don't know where, where to pick this team, quite honestly. Can you figure them out? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 again, I, I keep saying it, but wide range of outcomes again uh, with Louisville. Of course, uh, the, the coaching thing, hopefully for Louisville's sake, that will, that will start to subside towards December and beyond. But, um, you know, I think one of the interesting moves Louisville made was they hired an assistant coach, Ross McCain's, uh, excuse me, McMains, who's basically been responsible for installing a whole new offense, heavy on ball movement. Um, you know, I, I think that this is something that they really needed to mix up last year, uh, a really slow tempo team. I don't know if the tempo is going to change a whole lot, but I do think they want to use a lot of these new pieces they brought. Uh, L. Ellis was a Juco legend. How does he fit in? We don't know yet. Uh, I love Jared West from Marshall. I think we talked about him a lot last year. Uh, that That's a nice piece. I don't think he'll have much issues making the jump to the ACC. Noah Locke, we know from Florida, comes in. Um, so yeah, there's there's some uh, a lot of ingredients here, a ton of talent. Uh, but again, we saw Louisville uh, disappoint us several times last year. And I, there's not anything on paper or anything from the scrimmage over the weekend that can solve that. We need to see some real games until we can start to figure that out. Yeah, I think it's going to be a real interesting team to watch that could figure finish anywhere from near the top of the standings to be sitting on the bubbles. Uh, to, right. Uh, but uh, Titel, I think beyond these seven teams you already discussed, we kind of get into this middle pack of the ACC that is of a lot of teams that have good ceilings, but but low floors. And let me start, though, with. Well, let's start with the, the perennial bubble team of all time that uh, no Joby's going to miss out on discussing. But but how about Jim Beheim and his orange up there in Syracuse? How about all the Beheims in Syracuse? And all them, Jimmy yeah. and Buddy and Jim. I mean, uh, I wonder if Julie can uh, get out on the wing and lead the fast break or something. Uh, no, they're solid. Uh, they did lose a couple guys in the front court. So while I know they can hit threes for days, I'm still not sure if they have enough on the – interior defense and the rebounding. Um, they do have the longest active streak in division one. They've made every single, excuse me, had a winning season every year since 1970s. And I see no reason they won't make it 53 this year with teams like Georgetown on their schedule. Ha ha. But <laughs> I still think that this is not like uh, a serious ACC contender. Do you think they're an NCAA tournament team? Yes. Only cause I've, they screw me every year when I say they're not. So yes. <laughs> uh, uh, David, we already mentioned uh, Miami is going to be the first team we see in, in preseason. I think that's on uh, the 
uh, the uh, ESPN ACC network stream or something, but uh, yeah. you know, Jim Laranaga's team there in Miami, you kind of, th- you want to count them out, but, uh, and you kind of do. I, well, I mean, I don't want to count them out tomorrow. I think, I think they're going to yeah. win that one, but coming off a real disappointing year, uh, 10, only 10 total wins. I uh, not very good in the conference. Uh, I, Jim Laranaga is a phenomenal coach. He's done things that at Miami that, you, you know, winning the he's won ACC championships. He's gone to NCAA tournaments. He's gotten that program into the rankings a time or two. I just don't think that he's to the point to where it's going to happen consistently. And I don't think it's going to happen this year either. Okay. Well, well, Joby, I, I, I mean, when you look at this roster, though, you've got these double digit scores like crazy with Wong and McGust and, and Wong, Charlie Moore Wong coming over to Paul, Jordan could be Miller. ACC player of the year if someone like Machero is not. I mean, seriously, Wong, that 17 that he had last year, I think it's going to turn with a two in front of him. You know, you know I, by the, this year. The question is, I do wonder if some of the transfers in, if like, you know, from George Mason to Paul, I don't know if those double digits will carry over. And you know, Charlie Moore, it's going to, you know, can he do the same oh, way school. that Chris likes <laughs> did? I think losing likes is a big okay. deal. I think that is a big, I think Arkansas is going to, yeah, Muss is going to love him. And I, 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 you know, I don't know. I, I don't know how, I think Miami might repeat to a degree what they did last year in a lot of ways um, of being, yeah, I don't see a tournament, NCAA tournament, or an NIT bid for them. But the, the, I do see Long scoring a lot of points. The, 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 they were very injury prone last year, but I think you've got a bunch of injury prone guys. So I would not be surprised yeah. to I mean, see them lose a lot a of good player games. too. I mean, but yeah, I, you just don't. I, I don't see the piece. I really feel like okay. it wasn't it wasn't Wong who put the put it all together for them. I think it was likes, and missing likes is going to be a big, big deal. Well, well Rocco, I, I couldn't convince. Two people so far in my case for Miami. How, how about a case for somebody else like uh, maybe NC State? Interesting. I have a case for another team, but okay. I'll tell you later. Um, NC State's a team, though, I would call a dark horse in the league, mm-hmm. you know, main, mainly because I can't get rid of that uh, last impression at the end of last year. They had that five game winning streak headed in the ACC tournament. They basically had a winner go home game against Syracuse and they got Buddy Beheim at the end. Uh, but you know, NC State, you know, they had a nice nucleus there at the end with Helms and Bates and Hayes. Uh, now they get Morsel over from Joby's uh, guys in Virginia. Greg Gant comes over from Providence. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. Keats is kind of, I, I don't want to say hot seat, but it's starting to get a little warm. They, they seem to keep falling short. And, you know, we've already gone through seven, eight ACC teams. There's nothing, uh, I mean, obviously a ton of talent and NBA players, but Team wise, there's nothing that makes you shake in your boots. So a team like NC State could go from like a projected 10th or 11th in the league all the way up to the top five or so if everything comes together. And there's some signs there. So I, I definitely want to take them seriously. Uh, bubble out for now for me, but I, I, I've got them as a potential dark horse. Well, uh, to get before we get to your other team, uh, Tytal, let's take a quick mention of, of the defending ACC. If you go by the ACC rules, your your tournament <laughs> champion is your only champion. Your defending ACC champions in Georgia Tech uh, lost way too much, though. Yes, I mean I will never say anything bad about my fellow Wildcat Josh Passner, but and the cupboard's not totally bare. You still got uh, Michael Lebeau. He brings in uh, Davon Smith. He's got Jordan Usher back. I mean, they've got some pieces, but he lost a lot. And I think that they're not going to sneak up on anybody this year, which I think they kind of did last year, frankly. Uh, well, Joby, I don't, I love me throw this one to both you and Rocco. I'll start with you, Joby. I think this is where Rocco, you were going. Uh, how about the Irish? Yeah, I, I, I actually think, all right, we talk about the transfer portal having mixed up all these teams, whether it's Duke or North Carolina, Virginia, you know, all these teams at the top. But, you know, a team that really wasn't mixed up too much is Notre Dame. And they have real I mean, people like Prentice Hub, Cormac Ryan. These are these are real solid ACC players. I think another year under Mike Bray is going to uh, is going to really lead into a very, very successful year, especially early when everybody is trying to figure out their teams. Notre Dame is not going to have to do that. Notre Dame is going to hit the ground running. They're going to create some 
upsets here and there, especially in the front half of their schedule, that will equal possibly a postseason bid result. Yes. Well, well Rocco, I know you and I think to... in the NCAA. Uh, R- 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 Rocco, uh, you know, he didn't even mention you're bringing in the ex Ivy League player of the year and Paul Atkinson from, yeah. from Yale there. Uh, Got to give a little Ivy love here, too. Yeah, Atkinson comes over and, you know, and I, I think he's had a two a year off and, and he's going to be hungry. Ivy League player of the year, as you said, you know, Notre Dame is the most fascinating team to me because, you know, last year they were top 25 in offensive efficiency. There was like, you know, a lot of like results they probably were not happy with of course but they did have the win at Kentucky early they had the win at Duke that basically broke Duke's back for the rest of the year in early February they beat Florida State on the last game of the year and what that tells me is these teams loaded with shooters uh they're going to be able to outscore pretty much anyone you just don't know what night it's going to happen on so by the end of the year you're going to see a resume I think that's going to have some pretty darn good wins on it now they just got to like figure out how to get you know, six, seven games above 500 to balance that out. But I think they'll end up with some big wins. I also think, obviously, you can't get to the tournament with a 203rd ranked adjusted defense, especially as an ACC team. That's just flat out embarrassing. Woeful. But I do think <laughs> Woeful Atkinson, defense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think I, Mike Bray's going to rein that in. I really do. Atkinson, this is not a fly-by coach who just – Throws, you know, it's, he rolls the ball out like Paul, yeah, you, know, you know, like Paul Westhead or something. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I thought you were going somewhere else. Guys, <laughs> so it it would have been great. Last year. But, yeah, but I think Atkinson helps there a lot. Like I think he's going to bring some backbone there on the on the you know on the back end, and then uh, you know, obviously, the, everybody's a year older, so that's going to help too. Uh, David Clemson, we haven't discussed them. They were in the tournament last year. Uh, how about Brad Brownell Scott squad this season? Yeah, again, kind of flying under the radar in the tournament last year. Three starters back, a fairly solid looking backcourt. Um, you, you know, I, I don't. Again, I think that they're going to be at least in the discussion or near the bubble. Uh, I think they kind of deserve. I'm a little surprised that they don't seem to be getting a little more love. I certainly don't see them at the ass end of this conference. Well, I, I think they're relying on a couple of transfers that may be stepping up too much in class, like David Collins and Naz Bohannon. But uh, I, so I, I don't I see them on the wrong side of any bubble talk. And personally, okay. uh, but Titel, we got three teams we haven't discussed yet. Uh, your, your pick, Wake, Boston College, Pitt. <laughs> I will do Pitt just because I like the coaching staff with all the capels there. Um, and they had some amazing wins last year. I believe they beat Duke, which I didn't think was humanly possible. Um, and I know they haven't made the tournament in a while, but the schedule looks decent. Uh, a depleted Minnesota team, a horrible Vanderbilt team, an average St. John's team, and much like Notre Dame, a ton of seniors in Gouye, Sibande, Oladapo, and Burton. Um, Capel's been there now four years, and I think that he established something last year where he showed that he really can coach in this league, which I wasn't convinced of before. Um, certainly, again, not like a top four contender, but I don't think this is going to be the last place team in the ACC. You don't think it's going to be. Uh, Joby, uh, Wake Forest at Boston College, a couple of coaches here do that I want, like, but but which are, which, yeah, do you want, want go ahead. to pick the last place team or the non last place? Pick team? the non last place team. Then. The non last place team will be Wake. Okay. Because the other team is god awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, oh, they uh, and I think Forbes, I, I'm with you. I think Forbes is doing the right things at rebuilding Wake. Wake will, <laughs> I feel like I said this when Manning was coached too, though, sometimes early in his tenure. Um, I feel like they're on the right track, they've hit the nadir, and now they're coming back up. They're not, you know, this is going to be a team that gets four wins in the ACC five, it won't be one or zero, which someone else will be at. Um, but the, uh, but, and, and so the, they might have that upset over a team in the top half of Louisville or, or Notre Dame on a bad shooting night, a Louisville, you know, who is, doesn't have it right there. A Virginia team who might not have it, might be hit, not hitting the ball on a particular day in a defensive struggle. The, you know, Wake will get their share of wins. They they do have, yeah. You know, I actually don't know how much uh, Alondis Williams is actually going to help coming in. I know a lot of people say, oh, Oklahoma. No, no, no. Uh, Carter Witt's the story there. Awesome hair. 
Um, <laughs> Carter Witt will, uh, I think he will be able to generate uh, the and be a key factor in a lot of those plays. Uh, Rocco, uh, yeah. go ahead, David. Oh, okay. Well, I had a question for okay. Rocco, but but uh, I was going to ask him about this last team, uh, where yeah. they rank in the bean pot. And for our ACC fans that don't know what that is, that is Boston College, Boston U, Harvard, and Northeastern. Does BC finish last in that? Decent chance. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I probably wouldn't pick that, but I, I mean, it would be, it, there'd be some good games in there. BU just got picked to win the Patriot. Uh, yeah, was, I, I, I think they are last. And Northeastern's got the best coach in the city, so there yeah. you go. Um, but, hey, welcome Earl Grant. Speaking of Northeastern, he knows a thing or two about them. And, uh, you know, we loved what he did at Charleston. Um, you know, he's deserved the opportunity. He's just – working with a pretty bear uh, cover. <laughs> he got, he got Brevin Galloway to come with him, which is uh, important because Galloway filled it up in the CAA. It's going to be probably a little, some tough nights for him in the ACC, but at least there's some scoring there. Uh, Ashton Langford was a pretty good player. He's been at Providence. He's now been at BC a couple of years. Uh, you know, there's four COVID seniors. So again, they, they probably have enough there to, to avoid embarrassment most nights, but in general, they're just not going to be competitive, and, and I think you do have to pencil them in as last place. I don't know. Between Brevin Galloway and, like, uh, T.J. Bickerstaff from Drexel, I, th- I think Boston College has a, de- has a decent shot to finish near the top of near the top of the Colonial. Oh. And the, yeah, the Colonial. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I was going to say. Yeah. Near the top of the Colonial. Uh, uh, yeah, th- th- that is the 15 teams in the ACC, though. What I want to do is run through each of you at this point and tell me how many teams you think from this conference are going to make the – uh, make the NCAA tournament. Out. Yeah, we're talking, you know, other than Boston College, we know they're in, but other than, <laughs> but for the, as far as the rest of the conference, how many teams do you think are going to make it? Uh, if you want to tell me who those teams are too, that's fine. Uh, Joby, let me start with you. Uh, I think there will be eight. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it'll, it could even increase because it is a very, I actually think the middle is pretty strong as middles go. The problem is there will only be one team Team who's protected sea level probably thus there might only be it might be a replay of last year where the ACC performed poorly in the tournament uh I could see only one team make the second weekend and once again because you're going to have a ton of teams in that six five you know six through 12 you know uh, area and not get out of that not get beyond the second game yeah, the, the other question I meant to, I want to ask you is who's going to win the conference regular season title? Uh, that- I, 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 I think Duke, uh, yeah. the team, I think they will find their shooting uh, and uh, he'll start on the bench, but it'll wind up maybe being six minutes. Trevor Keels is the real deal. He, he will give him that along with Benchero. I think they will find that shooting touch that Wendell Moore could not deliver last year. Uh, Rocco, how about you? Champion and team number of teams? Yeah, so number of teams, seven. I've got Duke uh, penciled in as the champion. It's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's really close, though. Um, you know, I just do Duke's talent and all of that. You, you kind of have to give them benefit of the doubt. But I, I really have concerns about, uh, you know, just the a mental, emotional part of the experience they're going to go through and, and trying to recover from last year. I think there's there's a lot to that. And so we'll see, you know, they've cushioned themselves as best they could in the non-conference. Um, you know, they'll play a couple more key games, but a lot of them are just home cushy uh, uh, Cameron wins. And then the rest of the the seven are, um, you know, I've got Virginia, Florida state right there. Again, Virginia, as Joby mentioned, doesn't have the same level of talent by any means, but they have the best coach and they'll probably have the best defense. And that means a lot to my predictions. Um, and then, and then North Carolina, Louisville, uh, Louisville, again, wide range of outcomes. And then I do have uh, Virginia Tech and Notre Dame as the as the last two. Okay. Um, I actually personally really, really like almost agree with you completely. I think, though, it could go to eight. And the team I'm looking at is by eighth is NC State uh, as my as my sleeper, my dark horse team here. But Titel, what about you? Um. I think this is one of the more wide open conferences in the country. Um, I want to say Duke and I will say Duke because they have all this talent they're bringing in, but they brought in a lot of talent last year and it did not work at all. I think there's just going to be something extra special about the final year of coach K and the players are going to be playing their butts off for him. Um, As far as I think my number seven, 
I think Florida State makes it. I think Notre Dame makes it because they have so many seniors and I coach who's been there two decades. I think Vatech, Carolina, and Syracuse and Virginia, and then one of Georgia Tech or Louisville. I don't think Clemson is going to make it, and I don't believe in NC State as much as you guys. Okay, I think as much as me. I think I'm the one that that's high. Yes, I was, I was being rock, 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 yeah. so my age would have been Syracuse, bit. Chad, not yeah. NC State. Uh, I'm not in the Syracuse bandwagon, <laughs> of course. That means that they'll, you know, they'll be in the first four and make the make the final four. Uh, yeah. David. <laughs> Um, my pick to win it is Florida State. I, I think that they're the most complete team, and I think they're the most – That's even though they they lost a lot, I think what they have coming in, they're the most ready-made to be successful quickly. I'm going to go with six teams. I, I could see – and I, 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 th- I have a feeling that – I might renege on this a little bit and say that it's going to be seven or eight, but when I see this much turnover across the board in this league, and I realize it's not the only league that's like that, it makes me wonder, um, are enough teams ready for November and December to where the conference is collectively going to be in a position to where seven or eight teams can play their way in? And I could see it, not being that way. So I'm going to kind of go with six. Another thing is we'll get to this in another show. I think we're going to see more bids potentially out of some under the radar leagues that take away a seventh and an eighth bid from some of these power conferences this year. I'm glad you said at the end there, actually, David, because my comment was going to be, if you're putting only six in from this conference for that reason of the turnover, we've got to apply it to all the conferences, which means somebody's got to take those bids. And yeah. Now, now, are you looking at two or three Val- Missouri Valley schools? Are you looking at potentially? You know, yeah. Uh, uh, there's a, there's two or three in the Valley I like. There's two or three in the SoCon that I like. Uh, there's some in the Big West that I really like. I I think that there is an abundance this year of really good under the radar. Teams. And that four bid swack, we're going for it. Um, four bid swack. Yeah. <laughs> on that note, I do want to take a chance here to thank everybody for joining. I do want to run through quick. quick. Uh, any other final thoughts uh, from any of you on the on the ACC as a season, just just real quick, um, real quick final thought here because we are kind of out of time. Joby, real quick. Yeah, I, I'll I'll echo what David said because that is one thing. With a lot of ACC teams that are at the top are facing challenges early. Not Notre Dame, as we noted, but with the Griffin injury, you know, you know, for the defensive side for Duke for consistency, we're seeing a new coach at Carolina in a new system. You could see a stumble out of the gate, and you're exactly right, David. It could reduce bids. A lot of pressure in November for the ACC, given the parity, especially around the bubble. Uh, Rocco? Yeah, so I I would just say tentatively seven for me. I'm still slotting all the bids now, and I'm basically giving every – program a score and if it's a tournament caliber i think what's going to happen this year is i might end up with like 60 to 65 tournament caliber teams on paper but you only have 48 spots so you we'll see how it shakes out at the end of this process we you know this is conference number one here um so that'll be really interesting i'm glad david brought that up you've got tons of uh strong mid-majors with similar rosters um it's just going to come down to you know a do they have the schedules to impress and b can they game the net enough and blow teams out and maybe get a higher net like Loyola Chicago last year? We'll have to see how that plays out. It's going to be very fascinating. Well, we should see a more normal net, thankfully, this year, this year and not have Colgate yeah. number five in the country. But uh, Tytel, any other final thoughts to end us up in our show? Just that, had you told me even a couple of years ago that like the ACC newcomer of the year would be either Paul Atkinson from Yale or Buddy Bayheim from Cornell. Like, I wouldn't have believed you. It's nice to see that even after the Ivy did not have a season last year, its best players can try to compete with the best players in one of the best conferences. Absolutely. Uh, I guess on that note, uh, I do want to thank everybody for joining us here for the ACC preview. Uh, If you check on the tab up above, there is a season preview link. You can link to all of our season preview podcasts. There's also a link up there for all the exhibition games, like that Miami game we discussed at the top. Um, We will be recording for every single conference at some point or another, although some, a lot of them don't in a single podcast, but on behalf of John Titel and David Griggs up here, Rocco Miller and Joby Fortson below me, I'm Chad Sherwood. Thanks for joining us. And we will be talking to you again real soon.